Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me to such an excellent facility. And um, is there a way to switch on the board lights? Next to the, on the other side. To the right. It's called Tafelbeleuchtung. Okay. Tafelbeleuchtung. Okay. Uh, Wozitski residue for the projective pseudo-differential operator, so I thought I would start with a little introduction here. So maybe motivating that a little bit, let me explain what the eta invariant is. So the setup is very natural geometric global analysis. So we start with a closed Riemannian manifold. dimension is D and I have a Hermitian vector bundle on that manifold, over that manifold. So that's a Hermitian vector bundle. And then from a geometric point of view and also from a non-commutative geometry point of view, it's very natural to consider Dirac type operators which act on sections of that Hermitian vector bundle. So that's a Dirac type operator. And Dirac type, of course, just means that the square is of Laplace type. And then, assuming also that this is self joint. So D star is equal to D. And then, of course, there exists an orthonormal basis consisting of eigen. Uh, so then there exists an orthonormal basis phi i in L2, in the space of L2 sections with values in that vector bundle consisting of eigen uh, sections of the Dirac for the Dirac operator, lambda i, phi i, and lambda i, you can arrange them in such a way that, so this goes to plus infinity in increasing order and to minus infinity as i goes to uh, minus infinity. Of course, the spectrum is semi-bounded. It's not for the, like for the Laplace operator, so I should have the index here in Z rather than N. And then one can define uh, the eta invariant, so you just take the number of positive eigenvalues and minus the number of negative eigenvalues. Of course, to make sense out of that is a little bit more involved. So you can define this so-called eta invariant. Okay, number of positive eigenvalues minus the number of negative eigenvalues, which of course doesn't make sense because there are infinitely many. But what makes sense is that one can define the eta function, so eta of s, and I define it like that, so that's the sum over all eigenvalues that are not zero. And you take lambda i modulus to the power minus s and uh, multiply by the sine of lambda i. So then this is, uh, well, is a well-defined absolutely convergent function for, so this is defined as holomorphic for real part of s large enough. I guess larger than n over 2 or something like that, or n, like, say like that. And this has a holomorphic continuation, has a meromorphic continuation, a meromorphic continuation to the complex plane. And now the miracle is that zero is not a pole. So zero is not a pole. And that's quite amazing. Uh, that was, originally that was a sp spin-off from the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem for manifolds with boundary, for the, so for the Atiyah Patodi Singer Index Theorem. So it was remarked by Atiyah and Singer that uh, the residue of the eta function, which is a local expression, if you integrate that over a closed manifold, you always get zero. So it's kind of strange. And 
it's a non-trivial thing. So for example, in dimension three, it boils down to the two Bianchi ident identities if you work it out. So it's non-trivial identities. Uh, in, in higher dimension, it becomes more and more complicated. So now the interesting thing, so the residue, the residue at s is equal to zero of eta of s. So that's the thing which, which is supposed to vanish. Uh, is a local expression. So local means it's an integral of a quantity which can be computed on from the coefficients of the Dirac operator uh, uh, locally. And what you can show very easily, depending on what definition of the Wozitski residue you're using, is that this thing is proportional to the Wozitski residue of P plus, where P plus is the positive spectral projection of the Dirac operator. So B plus is just the same as chi. So the characteristic function of the positive half line of the So and of course this is a pseudo differential projection and the Wozitski residue is ba basically that. I'll explain in a second what the Wozitski residue is as well. And there is a theorem by Wozitski. Sorry. So and you can, uh, it's a more general theorem than the vanishing of the residue, of, of the eta residue. It says that whenever you have a pseudo differential projection, it's what Sitsky residue is zero. So and if P is a pseudo differential operator of order N, well, normally of order zero on M, as well as E, and such P squared is equal to P, then it follows that the Wozitski residue of P is equal to zero. Okay. So maybe I'll explain briefly what the Wozitski residue is, although maybe for this audience this is not really necessary. So the Wozitski residue can be defined like this. Uh, you take uh, the, in the homogeneous expansion of the symbol of, of A, in local coordinates, you take the minus, sorry, the minus d's, d was the dimension uh, coefficient. It's a function uh, of, of covector xi, well, on an x as well, so this is a variable in the cotangent bundle, and I'm integrating that over the cosphere of m. And because we are matrix valued, I also have to take the trace. And this, this is kind of wrong because this pretends to be coordinate independent, but it isn't. I mean, what, it, what is coordinate independent is only after you integrate that over a sphere. Anyway, so you do that in local coordinates, and you, the non-trivial fact is, it, in the end, it doesn't matter which coordinate charts you use and which local coordinates you're using. OK. Um, so what, where? In local coordinates, so a phi is just given by the usual thing. So we take e to the minus i psi x, um, a x comma psi phi hat. So in local coordinates, you can do the Fourier transform and. A of x chi has an expansion, so an asymptotic expansion for large xi. Um, starting the term that it homogeneous in xi of order n, and then going down steps of one. So that defines then this thing here. Okay. So of course there are a couple of technicalities. So this is up to smoothing operators only. Uh, so the infinite negative part we don't care about here. That's also reflected here by this symbol, which means that so this is unique up to smoothing operators. And okay, I'll just say it. So this is homogeneous of order n minus k in xi. It's smooth in x, and it's smooth in xi away from xi equal zero, where it cannot be smooth because of the homogeneity. 
Okay, so then the Wozitski residue is a trace on the algebra of pseudo differential operators. So then the Wozitski residue is a trace on the algebra of pseudo differential operators on M acting on the vector bundle E. So, of course, these A's are matrices here in local coordinates. Okay, so pseudo differential operators is something which I just defined. These are the operators that can be written like that. Um, another interesting thing is that you can also write the Wozitski residue, also the Wozitski residue of an operator A is also some, some constant which depends on D and on the rank of, uh, of E times the trace, sorry, the residue of S is equal to zero of the trace of A times D to the minus S. So that's another alternative definition which immediately shows you, by the way, that this is correct. You know, the, the residue density is, is exactly the same as the Wozitski residue. So if you take this definition, this becomes obvious. If you take that definition, then you have to do some unpleasant computation. Or you just use the fact uh, that the trace on the algebra of pseudo-differential operators is unique up to a factor, which doesn't save you anything because that's also an unpleasant computation. Okay. So then I should say one more thing. So the distributional kernel of A so this will be so this will be a distribution a distribution on the on M cross M with values in the bundle E box E star and its uh, singular support is on the diagonals because of pseudo locality. So the singular support in the diagonal and cross M. Okay, so now to something completely different. who said that we should consider vector bundles. Vector bundles are very unnatural from a quantum mechanical point of view. Why? Vector bundles are, you know, you take transition functions and you go from one coordinate chart to another coordinate chart using this transition function. And of course this has to be consistent with change of coordinate, right? You have a co-cycle condition. However, in quantum mechanics, there is a phase which we normally don't care about. So why, why do transition functions in vector bundles then have to satisfy this co-cycle condition? We could actually relax that a little bit and say, well, let's satisfy the co-cycle condition, but up to a phase only. Yeah? So this is very natural from a quantum mechanical point of view. Exactly, yeah. No, no, wait a second, it will be clear. No, I mean, vector bundle here means that you have a particle with spin, for example. So if an electron, it will be C2. But then the, the, the phase of the spin doesn't matter. You see, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, but also in non-commutative geometry, we know that what is important is not, is, not, is not vector spaces, but algebras. So why do we care about vector bundles? We should care about um, bundles of C-star algebras. So maybe I'll explain that a little bit. So if you look at projective pseudo-differential operators. OK, so if we have a particle with spin, then we have a vector bundle. And the algebra of observables of that will be the algebra of endomorphisms of that vector bundle, at least locally. 
So and V is a bundle well of finite dimensional simple C star algebras, also of matrix algebras. But I don't want to forget the star, so this star. And the transition functions will be given by algebra automorphisms. So what we get from this is there is an algebra, so we get a, a, a bundle of algebras, so a so-called Atsumaya bundle. of matrix algebras with transition functions being algebra homomorphisms. And now you can ask yourself an academic question. If I'm given such an Atsumaya bundle, can I always find a vector bundle E such that this Atsumaya bundle is the endomorphism algebra of that vector bundle? Yeah, it's a very natural question, and the answer is no. And the abstraction is the following. So, so given A, Our transition functions are automorphisms on the algebra of matrices, so on mat n, mat c. And of course, you can lift them, so they are inner, so you can lift them to a unitary, but only up to a phase, up to, a, up to an element in U1. So what happens is, so the, the abstraction, when can you do that globally, is if you, you, you choose uh, for every trivialization, for every, for every, sorry, not the trivialization, from every, for every, what is it called, transition from one chart to another, you choose that automorphism, then you lift that automorphism to an element of U1, and then you get uh, a check co-cycle, but it violates, may violate the co-cycle condition, right? So, sorry, what you get is an element in, so we get an element in H2, check homology with values in U1. And if that's coming from a vector bundle, that must, must have been trivial because it, it will be coming, well, it's precisely the condition that it's trivial, is it's coming from a vector bundle. Okay? So, and now, of course, uh, that's isomorphic to H3 of M with values in Z because of the, so this here is a sheaf cohomology with values in U1, and then here I'm just using the exact sequence, um, sorry, okay, so we have this exact sequence that gives of course a long exact sequence in sheaf cohomology, and because of that you get an element in H3 of MZ, and you see, that's precisely the, the obstruction. So if that, that element is non-trivial, then we have a bundle which, which does not come from a vector bundle. But again, from a quantum mechanical point of view, it's completely fine. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I always have to learn the talk by heart, because as soon as I'm standing at the border, the brain somehow shuts down. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Good, okay, so it's okay now. <laughs> but thanks very much. And I think the talk is recorded, so it's, it's always a nuisance if you look after what it is and then you see something like that. Okay, so now, uh, nevertheless, so such a bundle of Atsumaya, so, so such an Atsumaya bundle of algebras, so this will give rise, so A will give rise give rise to the C star algebra, namely the algebra of sections. So we take the algebra of sections as well as in A. So of course that has then a K theory. So the K theory, so let's, um, let's say that we have an element C here. So this is this, um, um, this element in H, this cohomology class in H3MZ, so this is in here. No, sorry. <laughs> the K theory, K of C of M of A. 
So this is the so-called twisted case theory. Is the twisted case theory. of M twisted by this element C. So you could define it like that. Okay, so now the most natural thing is why not to build an algebra of pseudo-differential operators whose symbols, rather than being in and E, live in A. That's very natural. And that's what I'm going to do now. So that, that has been done. Maybe I should write down a couple of names. So now, the idea. And that's probably Matai, Melrose, also Singer. I hope I didn't forget anybody. So built an algebra of pseudo differential operators uh, with values in A. So replacing the algebra of pseudo differential operators acting on the vector bundle E. And maybe look at the index theorem. For example, and they proved the Yatia Singer index theorem in this context, and you can get some very funny things. For example, the index of an operator might be non zero. Yeah. Uh, sorry, might be non, um, not an integer, might be rational. So prove the index theorem, the Yatia Singer index theorem. So this was done eh, by. Uh, Matai, Melrose, and Singer. And amazing is, so the index may be non-integer. But what is good, for example, the Dirac operator always exists in this category even without spin structure. So for example, you can compute the index of the Dirac operator on CP2, which doesn't have a spin structure. So Dirac operators. always exist in this category. Yes. I guess you could probably could generalize it to a general. Yeah, at the moment I'm, I'm looking at, at finite dimension. But you could probably take the compact operators, maybe. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So that's maybe I should say that if you have finite dimensional, finite dimensional situation, you always get torsion elements here. But there is another story. I mean, even if you don't have torsion, that, that might still be some, give you something new. OK, so then what we wanted to do, and uh, say that before I forget it, so this whole thing is a joint project, was a joint work with York Seiler. So this is joint work with York Seiler. Who at that time was in Loughborough, my colleague, but he somehow uh, left to a climatically more favorable place. And what we wanted to do is so prove Utsitsky's theorem in this, in this category. And uh, there are very nice proofs by, by Gilke, for example, of Fuzitsky's theorem. Uh, they all use uh, spectral theory quite heavily. But I will now explain to you in a second why that doesn't work here. Because there is no vector bundle. There is no L2 space of sections. So therefore, there is no spectrum either. So there are no eigen sections. There is no zeta function. So all these things you don't have anymore. Therefore, you have to find a purely algebraic proof of that. So I want to lay out the structure a little bit. Um, so what can you do in this twisted category and what, what, what can you not do? So uh, the Rubinsky theorem is that uh, the Rubinsky residue of a projection is zero. Correct. So I should say that this would be trivial if it was a local statement, but it isn't. It's not a local statement. It's a global statement and therefore you have to prove it uh, also in this, this category. 
Okay, so what do we need? So we start with, so once again, projective pseudo-differential operators. And so let's start with an Atsumaya bundle. This is an Atsumaya bundle, finite dimensional. But that's not enough to build a, an algebra of pseudo-differential operators because you have to build products. So it means that you have to convolve kernels. And if you convolve kernels, you can't do it just on the diagonal. You have to be a little bit off diagonal. So at least you have to consider the terms yeah, on, the, of the, on the diagonal. So it's not enough to consider functions on the diagonal. And therefore, an Atsumaya bundle is actually not, not enough to, to build this category of um, um, of pseudo-differential operators. So what we need, so we also need a so-called star convolution bundle. So that's something we worked out, a star convolution bundle. I will not give you the details because anybody who hears the word star convolution bundle will come up with a definition that will work. Um, so it's just the obvious thing, convolution bundle. on a neighborhood of the diagonal. So we take the diagonal in M cross M. And let's give the neighborhood a name. So let's call it U. So we have a bundle F. And this bundle should have the following structure that you should have, so F, with a multiplication map oh. So, and I'm not going to write it down as bundle morphisms because then I'll have to say much more. So, there is an obvious thing. Maybe you can also phrase it in terms of group points, by the way. I just haven't thought about this. So if you, if you take things that could be multiplied, if you could be convolved in, for the pair group weight, so then you want that multiplication map here. So f of y comma z, and that multiplication map should be an element in f of x comma z. So this mimics So what this mimics is the bundle E box tensor E star on M cross M. But since there is no E, I cannot, I cannot say anything of that kind. So I just have this convolution bundle. So first of all, that, that allows me to write down this multiplication map. But there is one more thing I want is that there is another map and star, map star, which goes uh, from x, y to the fiber y, comma x. And this should be conjugate linear and should be an involution. And of course, that should be just the conjugate, uh, the, the, um, what is it called? Complex con the conjugate, <laughs> the star, the edge point, sorry, the edge point. So, and then you just write down a couple of axioms and compatibilities to, to, mimic, to mimic that situation. And then, of course, if you have, if you have that, so given such a bundle, one can define pseudo-differential operators uh, on M with values in A. And you see, I took only a neighborhood of the diagonal. So if you convolve, that will, you will leave the neighborhood, so that's bad. But in pseudo-differential operators, you can do many things if you throw out the smoothing operators. So that's the so-called algebra of symbols. So this can be defined. Eh? And this is enough to compute the index. It's enough to compute the Wozitski residue and so on. So it's enough for many things. And here is something I have not thought about, even though this paper is quite old. I think it's from 2010. So I would write to like. Uh, because I have a lot of teaching, so I didn't have time to think about this. So question, maybe somebody can come up with that. Is it always so given 
m, uh, sorry, given a, is it always possible to choose f such that u is actually the same as m? So that's the question. I have no idea, yeah? What is certainly always possible? Sorry? Oh, then yes, yeah, yeah, sure. So then yes, but that's also not unique. Yeah. So yeah, if, if you take a neighborhood, you're right. Yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, the main thing is is that one here. Yeah. So because so let me just advertise that a little bit because I think I have a little bit of time. Um, oh yeah, that's not written here. Um, so you want f restricted to the diagonal should be the same as a. Can you still see that? Yeah. But shouldn't the positive answer imply that a is stably trivial at least? So it is stabilized. So it's somehow a weaker equivalent. So if it takes you two pullbacks to uh, the projection. Are you solving the question? <laughs> 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 Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. So. I think you shouldn't expect that. Yeah. Okay. But maybe there are some cases where it is the case. So that be, that would be nice because you could still define the you could actually define the algebra of pseudo differential operators. Okay, my question then. Let me modify my question. So, if we, are there cases where where you can define this f globally, but you can't define e? I think the question might be related to are there matrix algebra bundles that become trivial after you stabilize them? So mm -hmm. Oh, here is another question. So, like, let, let's not take this question very literally, because what, what could also be interesting is, are there other f's? If you're given a bundle A which comes from, from E tensor E star, can you find other f's which restrict to A on the diagonal, but which are different? Uh, okay, let me just explain why that could be an interesting question, because then you could define the algebra of pseudo-differential operators. Therefore, you could also define the C star algebra of zero-order pseudo-differential operators. So you could do, uh, so in the sense of non commutative geometry, that could be quite interesting because there is no Dirac operator on CP2, but uh, not, not, not acting on a vector bundle, but there is a Dirac operator on CP2, which would be affiliated to that C star algebra. So that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah. So maybe you're right. Maybe, the, uh, so, uh, maybe, maybe one can. So, no, I don't know. So what did you say? No, you didn't, you didn't say anything about E, right? Well, what that tells you is that when you pull back your bundle A to n times n by our, the coordinate projections, then they are for which I could mm -hmm. That so seems to me to say that this A has to be kind of trivial mm -hmm. for constant. So trivial in this sense, yeah? uh, in the sense of being an endomorphism of... Yeah. But then you can stabilize it, and it almost becomes a stabilized morphism, so you could probably trivialize it further. Okay, maybe. Okay, so once, if you, if you construct something that is uh, such an F which restricts to, to A on the diagonal, you can define a, a global pseudo differential uh, operator algebra. And you can do a lot of lot things more. Maybe you can even do some kind of spectral theory. Okay, so then once you have that, you can define differential operators. So differential operators so these are these are of course pseudo differential operators which live on the diagonal.
So differential operators if k m with values in f, and I think you still need the f for that, are operators in, um, well, so differential operators of order k with values in f. So in local coordinates, this will, so they haven't given you a proper definition of pseudo differential operator, but the definition is just local. So it means that you localize in a coordinate chart, trivialize your A in the sense of you write it as an endomorphism of E, then you trivialize your E. So everything will be matrix valued local coordinates. And then it's supposed to be a pseudo differential operator kernel in those local coordinates. Okay, and the same is true for differential operators. You could still write down everything local and then you patch them together using the structure of A and F. So our operators in, uh, in this here is kernel supported on the diagonal. So and they form an algebra. So they, they do form a star algebra. So this like that, and F form a star algebra. And then once you have that, you can do even a little bit of differential geometry just to give you the flavor of that. So you could, for example, define what a connection is. So connections. On A. So, and of course, you want you mimicking just the behavior of a connection on E. So it's a linear map. Is a linear map which goes from vector fields to differential operators in this category of order one. So we have vector fields. to differential operators of order one. And just there are some natural conditions which you can still write down using only the algebra. So it's modular homomorphism, so why is the vector field f is a smooth function? equal to f and then the commutator in this algebra now should be the same as the multiplication operator by, well, by yf and it's called Hermitian if there is another condition 3 satisfied So there is a star, remember? We have a star because of this star structure. So the divergence of y should be zero. So this just mimics the, the behavior of a connection on the vector bundle E. Um, so we can write down what that means. And since you can write down what a connection is globally, um, and you can write down what, what Clifford, what the, I mean the Clifford algebra bundle naturally is a Natsumaya bundle, right? It's not represented on a on a vector bundle. So what you can therefore write down what, what, a, what a generalized Dirac operator is. So also one can find or one can define the concept of a generalized Dirac operator in the algebra of differential operators of order one with values in F. So maybe it's time to remind the audience what there is a hierarchy of Dirac operators. So there is that Dirac operator, which is associated, associated to a spin structure. But there are a couple of other notions which are quite important. So the, the, the vaguest concept is that of a Dirac type operator. That's just a condition on the principal symbol. Dirac type just means you square it. The principal symbol is the metric and diagonal. 
Then the next level is the concept of a generalized Dirac operator, which means that it's, uh, it's constructed out of a Clifford action and a compatible connection yeah, on the bundle. So that's already a little bit more. That also fixes the, um, it fixes the zero order part and doesn't fix only the principal symbol, but also the, the zero order part. So, and, and so that's a little bit more special here. So because you can write down these things with values in that bundle, it still makes sense to say those things. Okay, so then I should probably state the theorem now. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you were mentioning the, the Dirac operator outside the spin context. Yeah. Uh, how is that related to positive scalar curvature? Well, if if related at all. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I don't I don't know. Well, uh, the square in the spin. Yeah, so you always have this Bochner Bochner right. this formula. So if you square the Dirac operator, uh, then you get the the spin Laplace operator plus r over, over four over six. So that's the Pauli Schrödinger Lichner Horowitz formula. And of course, if you have, so you have two positive operators, and uh, so the spectrum will give you, for example, if you, if you have positive sc scalar curvature, you will, the index will be zero. No, so no, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. Oh, that's what you ask. Okay, yeah. I see, sorry. I saw, Is there okay. anything like that in the Nordspin case? I haven't thought about this. I mean, the, the Bochner Lichner Horowitz Schrödinger formula, <laughs> because I'm Austrian. Yeah, um, how much you was Schrödinger? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, certainly holds here. I mean, that, that's definitely true as well. But there is no notion of spectrum. Okay. So you see that, that argument, yeah? The, the operator doesn't have a kernel and neither has, uh, I mean, the, the supersymmetric Dirac operator doesn't have a kernel no, no, but because of positive the, scalar. The index is zero, that's the question. Um, I don't know, but I, it's not obvious to me why it should be. Maybe one, if one thinks about it longer, then maybe the answer is no, but uh, yeah, I don't know. For example, the index doesn't even have to be the integer. So, so what, what I said was, that, so what I wanted to say, the usual argument doesn't work because there is no, you, you can't conclude. The index doesn't have that interpretation as the kernel of something. But who knows, yeah? maybe that would be an interesting thing to think about. Oh, well, you can always, yeah, so that's right, I didn't, I didn't tell you. So, I mean, so depending on how much you know, yeah, the index is either defined or not defined. Um, the index is, is, is defined only in, in the usual category of pseudo-differential operators. Um, the smoothing part doesn't matter for the index. And there are various ways to see that. And um, so, for example, one easy way of seeing that would be the McKean-Singer uh, formula where you can localize it more and more on the diagonal to compute the index. So maybe I, I should say that. But I think that our examples of non-spin manifolds which have uh, rational, they have been this convention in the cloud for which is scalar curvature matrix. So this hints at that, uh, um, at least the happiness, that's, I think that's the index that you get then there. Should not be an obstruction to positive scalar curvature matrix. Yes. Maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, that's certainly something one, one, one could probably answer by taking some time off. Yeah. I mean, the index doesn't have a spectral interpretation anymore. So I cannot define it as dimension of the kernel of D minus dimension of the co-kernel of the index belongs to the K theory of the Hatsumaya. Yeah, that's, that's a reasonable expectation. Yeah. And then the sum of use a number out of that, which is fine. So yeah, that's right. Let's explain why you, how you could use a number and then once yeah, so for that, you might right. study vanishing questions because I think if you look at it in the case of the Zemaya algebra, then it becomes more natural to speak. And such questions like this one might be more easy to track. Mm. I think it might have something to do also with uh, Dirac operator this coefficient. If we put Dirac this coefficient in the vector bundle, uh, then I suppose it's not just the curvature of the space, but also something with the vector bundle coming in. And I think here is the Matsumaya algebra is already putting in some coefficients 
from scratch and uh, you always have coefficients and so you must always put in this extra term. And then mm -hmm. my guess would be that if you if you put in the right curvature term for this Hatsumaya algebra, then it might there might still be a positive a true statement, but it wouldn't just be curvature of the manifold, but it might be an extra term for the Hatsumaya algebra. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, so, so for these questions with positive scalar curvature, I don't think that, that K theory or anything abstract of that kind will be suitable because here it's very important, uh, the smoothing part is very important, yeah? Because that, that might actually change something. So this, uh, these curvature terms, they will, they will come up in the smoothing part of the, of the operator. I mean, the, the fact that the kernel is zero, it's something which you can just change by, by adding smoothing operators. So therefore, I, I would think that maybe you can get something out of that if you can find an F. Which is which, so we can find, define the convolution algebra rather than just the symbol algebra, I would think. Yeah. Okay, let's let's prove the theorem because it's very easy. Um, Okay, theorem given F as before and Psi P a pseudo differential projection follows that the Wolsitsky residue of P is equal to zero. There are a couple of things you have to check, of course, before proving something like that. For example, the, the Wolsitsky residue needs to be defined, right? And it needs to be a trace. And the fact that the Wolsitsky residue is defined as a trace is, is a non-local thing. Okay, so you have to prove that as well in this category, but you can do it. So we have done that and you can do it. I don't claim originality, it's probably also implicitly contained in papers of Melrose and Matai. Okay. So the remark would be that the Fotsitsky residue is well defined given that structure. And is a trace. And then there is something which I'm not proud of, which, which will have an extra assumption, unfortunately, if the dimension is odd. Okay, so that's, that's an assumption that I have to make here. So if somebody has a, another proof which works for even dimensions, please feel encouraged. Okay, so we found a very easy algebraic proof and now it's so, so easy that it fits in the 10 minutes. Oops, okay. So maybe, okay, let's say sketch of proof. Okay, so you define the algebra A to be the, the algebra of pseudo differential operators. Well, let's say we have done the reduction, it's enough to consider zero order operators, okay? So this algebra of pseudo differential operators with values in A, modulo smoothing operators, but now I'm going to factor out pseudo differential operators of order n minus one, minus n minus one, with values in A, uh, sorry, I think I should say F here. Okay, so that's an algebra, of course. And the Wozitsky residue clearly vanishes on those because it's integrating the order n part, and n should be D, of course. Sorry. So the Wozitsky residue, of course, is still a trace from A to C. On 
this algebra A. Yeah, so that's clear. And then um, let's look at the at I, uh, the ideal A. So I. That's I will go, I'm going to take the pseudo differential operators of order minus one with values in F. And again, I'm factorizing out the minus d minus one part. So this is a, an ideal, and it's nilpotent. Is a nilpotent ideal in A. And of course, the Wozitsky residue, because it's a trace, it uh, becomes a map from K0 of A, and here I mean the alg algebraic K theory, uh, to C. But there apparent that, so there is a well known theorem in algebraic K theory, which says that if you have an ill-potent ideal, and you, you can factor it out for free, this becomes an isomorphism in K theory. So this is a very, very interesting theorem, which we didn't know. We, in fact, we proved it. And then, of course, we f figured out that, uh, that it was well known. So therefore, you get that the Wozitski residue actually is a map from that. And that's the same as the twisted K theory um, of S star M, right, because the algebra uh, of pseudo differential operators of order zero modulo the algebra of pseudo differential operators of order minus one because of the simple map that's just the C star algebra of continuous functions on the sphere bundle. But of course, with values in, in the pullback of F again. So you have to, of A. So this is the bundle A, which is the bundle on M, and you pull it back to, to S star. And this just by definition is the, the algebraic K theory of, of this C star algebra of functions on the co sphere bundle with values in, in A. Okay, so once you have on this, so that's very easy. That's actually something which, which comes almost for free there, if you know that theorem. Uh, and then all you need to check is that that map is zero. And for that, we used, so normally in the classical, Classical proof is similar, except that it uses the zeta function to, to show this stuff here. And it also uses cohomology to show this, but we don't have that available here because we are in this twisted uh, category. So instead, just going to use the twisted version of the Lirie Hirsch theorem. No, certainly not. No, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, so what, what is it? You take the symbol, the local symbol. Oh, it's the symbol? You take the, the symbol of that operator in local coordinates, and you integrate that over the, course, over the sphere at every point, and then you can show that you get a well-defined density, which you can integrate then. So that still makes sense. So maybe I should leave that here. So now, if M is oriented, and if it isn't, then you go to the oriented double cover. So then you can compute K0 of S star M, pi star A. Well, of course, nothing changes here, so if you tensor with the rationals. Okay, let's tensor with the reals because I'm, uh, I'm a member of the analysis group, so maybe we should tensor with the rationals. And so you, you have that. Uh, so this is generated as a K0 M A module. Yeah, that's right. 
by, by the identity and something else and the bot element well by some constant let's say some element C so I'm using here a, a, a Leary Hirsch theorem which is adapted to K theory well it's adapted to twisted K theory but if you just look at the proof of the Leary Hirsch theorem you can easily transcribe everything to twisted K theory because all you need is the six term exact sequence in, uh, in the K theory of C star algebras so what you need is uh, an element in K zero of S star M which restricts to every sphere to the non-trivial generator of K zero on the sphere and and uh, any sim principal symbol of, Dirac, of a Dirac operator will do that okay which is the principal symbol for example of the odd signature operator so therefore you can always write uh, any element in here can be written as so if so therefore if you have a class F in oh, what are these brackets here if you have a class F in K0 of S star M with values in F then you can write that as so F can be written as G plus E tensor this C here maybe tensor is stupid here so this is just the product in K theory and so now this is this of course vanishes the Wojcicki residue because these are the present representatives of that are just endomorphisms and endomorphisms the symbolic expansion it's just you know it stops it has a zero order part and then there is nothing else so the Wojcicki residue of that is of course zero so that's very trivial okay and then we have to worry about the Wojcicki residue of that and the Wojcicki residue of that so you just have to think a little bit to realize that this product in K theory is the same as twisting as twisting the Dirac operator so you take a Dirac operator so that's an honest Dirac operator acting on an honest vector bundle but then you twist it which you can still do in that category by by let's say a vector bundle or a virtual vector bundle uh, which has now values in well by projector in, in A so you can do that still what you get is a twisted Dirac operator this twisted Dirac operator will be now um, I think I deleted that already will be a differential operator in that in that category and you can always arrange that to be a generalized Dirac operator in the sense I said before so once again let's remember all these things still make sense generalized Dirac operator makes sense and that means locally it's also a generalized Dirac operator and two minutes yeah. I'll need only one <laughs> so this so the Wojcicki residue of F is zero this is trivial this is okay and the Wojcicki residue of E times C is also zero because even the residue density for generalized Dirac <laughs> operators is known to vanish so that's even a local statement so the residue density vanishes for generalized Dirac operators this is a well-known result the residue density vanishes for, Dirac, for generalized Dirac operators so this was proved by Gilkey originally using invariance theory but nowadays there are very easy proofs using conformal invariance so this is uh, also not something where you have to work extremely hard these days it's not easy to see it's not something simple like odd, odd operators and you integrate them and you get zero unfortunately it's, you have to do a little bit more than that okay so this this is that uh, so that finishes the proof well modulo technicalities and now let me just say one more thing now Gilke has a very nice argument he goes to the product 
and he then just reduces the even dimensional case to the odd dimensional case, but that uses the spectrum again and eigenfunctions. Yeah, bad luck doesn't work like this. Yeah. So if somebody has uh, spare time, you can transcribe the proof of Gilkey maybe to, to the even dimensional case. That would be nice because I'm pretty sure that the theorem also holds an even dimension. Okay, thanks very much.